Thank you so much. Thank you. This is Don. Well, uh, do you want to? Why don't you introduce? Them? No, let's be kind. If you like. I'd like to, but you're the you are their commander. Why don't you give us all? <laughs> this is Thelma. Rodrigo Prieto and Anna Tillinger Pascal. Uh, it's very hard to do this because the, the, the mood that you've just created. Oh, <laughs> did you just see it? Yes, and you cast a spell. I saw it the other morning, that's how I felt. I felt it as if you would cast a spell. And it takes a little time to digest, but uh, but we're so so happy that you're here to help us appreciate the film even more. And this has been many years coming. Yes. Tell us a little about that. Well, it was a, a book that was given to me by uh, Archbishop Paul Moore of uh, the Episcopal Church in New York. After him, after his having seen. A rough cut of uh, Last Temptation of Christ, and he uh, happened to like it or uh, agreed with a lot of it. And we had long talks with him, as Tom Pollock, I think Casey Silver, and uh, Sean Daniel, I forget. But we were all together. Thelma, Michael Powell was there, and uh, he was very supportive. And also, he was, was quite a man, quite really interesting, interesting. And he said to me, "I'm going to give you a book um, about faith." And uh, compassion, uh, and sort of thing. so he gave me the book a couple of days later, and it took me about a year to be able to, to get myself together to read it. And I finished in Japan when I was there for uh, uh, being in a, a, a Kira Kurosawa film, Dreams, and um, I finished it on a bullet train from Tokyo to um, Kyoto, and I knew immediately that I had to do something with this book. I, I knew that it went deeper. Um, my 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 own kind of <laughs> my own kind of searching that I was doing in, in Mean Streets and Taxi Driver, uh, Reggie Bull, definitely, um, and Last Temptation. Uh, Last Temptation had taken me. I've gone on one road, and this one was going to take me deeper onto another. The problem was I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know why I was so transformed by the book. And it took, that was 1989. Within a year or so, where I can, uh, Vittorio and Mario Cecchigori bought it for me. Um, and uh, uh, Jay Cox and I tried to write a copy of the uh, a version of the script within a year. But we only got a third or halfway through because once again I got sidetracked by uh, history, the uh, exposition. Uh, the cultural, the cultural clashes. I had to find ways to do the cultural clashes within the story itself, within the shots, within the scenes, within the body language, all of that sort of thing. It shouldn't take over the picture. It, it had to be all a seamless, kind of quiet film. Um, but ultimately, it was the last 20 minutes of the picture that really took me the longest time. But the, the long story is that I never let go of the project. There were legal issues, I was going to be sued for not doing it, and you know, countersuits, and uh, or fake lawsuits, I don't know what went on. Uh, and ultimately, I went off and made other pictures, but what was happening was that I kept reading the book, and kept reading the book, making notes, making notes, and as, you know, I, was, I just made good fellas. So, it's 1990, between 1990 and 2000, <laughs> between 1990 and 2005, I, I lived a life. And then I lived the life with, with that story that I felt I still had to make. It was very difficult for my representatives to uh, try to control the rights for me. And there's lots of money paid out. And finally, by 2006, this time around 2006, around Christmas time, Jay and I got a, we finally put ourselves in a hotel room and wrote the script. And then it took another seven years to get the film made for different reasons, family issues, and. Um, all sorts of other things, but uh, finances. It's a, it's a um, 
about having to notice the budget and that kind of thing. She kept telling me. But anyway, it, it was, it's, it's a project. It was really, I must say, uh, just a personal uh, pilgrimage. Well, when you say you, you, you lived a life those years, that 15 years, uh, do you think that you were better equipped to deal with the material those 15 years later? Do you think you had, uh, were either more had a deeper understanding of it or a clearer picture of it? Well, I think I had no choice. In other words, if I was still interested, then I had to find a clearer picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found it in the life uh, around me. Mm -hmm. uh, the family and the, and, and the child, uh, uh, being able to work with my collaborators and certain films, uh, uh, the values of life and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And. Did you ever have a moment, I mean, uh, I know you're very self-critical in, in, in many ways, but did you ever have a moment in, say, the past five, six years, heading towards production, when you finally felt, I've got it? Or did you, were you always, did you always have some uncertainty? No, I felt, I felt we had it. Um, what Jay and I put together in the, uh, on the script, particularly his additions, uh, and certain sections of the, the last part of the picture, um, we questioned, we pushed, we argued, uh, got people's opinions, uh, but I knew it was right. Uh, particularly when we started dealing with the consultants. Uh, Mr. Van Gessel, who was a good friend of Endo's, mm -hmm. uh, as a, a historian, uh, who else? William uh, uh, um, Brocky, and of course, uh, James Martin, and people like that. They, they, they argued, we all discussed certain things, but it made me sure about how to go. Mm -hmm. you know. uh, I'm going to get to your collaborators in just a moment, but the, the last thing I want to ask you before we, we open to the panel is casting. The crucial decision of casting this film. How did you arrive at the actors you chose? I think you chose awfully well. Oh, thank you. I, uh, it, but the casting idea started back in 91. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't born. <laughs> Just I, mean, I, I couldn't say I wanted it because, but it was, uh, it was um, the casting ideas. You know, as I thought I was going to make the film, there were new actors, <laughs> and because the original actors that I had planned, they got too old. <laughs> they got too old, and then the industry kept changing. Uh, who would put money, uh, finance a picture like this, uh, with these themes, these ideas, and also who could, uh, you know. I don't who's financeable in terms of uh, actors. Um, and as we went along in 2009, we went to Tokyo, all of us, we cast most of the picture at that point, the Japanese actors, <coughs> Alan Lewis, all of us there, you know. Um, and we really thought we'd get a good location scout of all of uh, uh, Nagasaki and Satomi Village and all that. Satomi Village is the real village that, he, that Tomoji is based on. There's an Endo Museum there, it's quite beautiful. Uh, and uh, get a sense of the landscape and a sense of the, uh, the nature around us and that sort of thing. But um, at that point, uh, there were different actors involved. There were a number of actors over the years that, while I was trying to get the script together, there were a couple of actors who were very well known, who were really respectful, and, and uh, met with me many times, and then finally got to meet with me and tell me, I don't like, I don't do this. I don't believe it. I believe they're all charlatans. Uh, in some cases, it says, I'm not all believe it, but my experience with some of these types of people that they're phonies. Uh, and I just, I'm not into it. I don't, I don't, I can't bring myself, uh, especially the last, uh, the apostasy. Because mm -hmm. they take it on a surface value. And, I, um, and it was very, actually, it was, it was a good thing. Because they had to say, look, I, can't, I, don't, I don't get it. <laughs> you know, and then ultimately, by the time we were able to uh, pull the picture together somehow, and I can tell you that, um, Ellen and I did uh, auditions, and from the lists that we were, uh, that was suggested. <laughs> uh, well, it, it, it's each few months there's new people and, you know, and all this stuff going on. Um, and uh, I, I remember Andrew Garfield coming in, I saw Boy A, which I liked him in, Never Let Me Go, I saw Spider-Man, you know, the, the, the first half when he's not the spider. <laughs> you know, he's good in the spider too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, long story short, 
we kept him for two and a half hours in the, in the audition. Because right. he, he did one scene, I said, do it again. I gave him some direction, he did it. And I said, well, I looked at Ellen, I said, well, I'll try this scene then. We tried that one and this one. Uh, and, and I saw the emotional level. And I believed him. Mm. I believed him. And he just done Death of a Salesman from right. Mike Nichols, mm -hmm. which I hadn't seen him, but he was telling me it was terrific. And so I, uh, that's how we did it, really, the audition of that. And then I, I know Adam Driver from Girls on TV and um, met with him. He didn't say anything <laughs> <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> Finally, at the end of it, I said, do you want to do this? Go shell <laughs> down. Uh, and um, Liam, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Karen Hines, too. Right. Yeah. And I, I went more uh, Celtic in that way, seriously, because Andrew's. Well, I mean, it, it, there were ways to go. Um, if one were to go more Latin, you'd have to cast all of the actors as Latin mm -hmm. actors. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a, a choice that we made. But that's so, well, one of the things that's so remarkable about the film, from my, my point of view, is that you just you accept them right away. I, I did. I, I just saw this four days ago. I just accepted them, didn't question the validity of things good, being Portuguese priests, and, 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 and we're off and running. And, and yeah, that's good. Because I did meet some Portuguese Jesuits uh, in the Jesuit uh, Oriental was that, that night. Uh, and they do, they, hmm. it was fine. I mean, they really, I said, I apologize to them. They said, no, no, no. And then when they saw the film, I was looking at them. They were pretty close. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's very different from Spanish. It's very different from Spanish, very different from any of the other, uh, particularly uh, as they, so Emma, what what were the what were the, the the last links in this long chain toward finally getting this movie made? Well, so it was, it was during when, when we started with the Wall Street, he said after this, we're when, you know silence is next for sure, no matter what. So then well, it was always next. But we never it was always next. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. The next one. You know? So. Uh, Erwin and I, Erwin Winkler and I, sprang into action and spent months and months and months pouring through the the chain of title and all the lawsuits that Marty mentioned and all that and cleared all that up and then Randall Emmett came on board and financed, put the financing together and we were off to the to the races. Dante and I went to Taiwan after Dante had been to New Zealand, Vancouver, where else did you go? Morning, California. I prefer actually this movie for five times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in New Zealand, yeah. I've been in uh, North California, I've been uh, in Canada, I've been uh, in. Everywhere. I don't remember. Exactly. <laughs> I saw so many places and then. We, say, we, we decided we decide. to go to Taiwan. Taiwan, yeah. and we pulled off a miracle over there. Made the movie for $46 million. Um, which I, I will say, actually, 20, we actually made the movie for 22 which is quite remarkable for 73 days. And that's what you days. saw on that screen for that amount of money. Yeah, Rodrigo, Dante, Thelma, I mean, I just, I just stood back and said, whatever you guys need, I mean, let me make it happen for you, and that was, that was my contribution. Uh, uh, Dante, this, this takes place in the 17th century. Uh, obviously, there's no photographs. Uh, I don't know what kind of drawings, what kind of uh, early illustrations may exist in, in, in the books. Well, actually, I saw some books with paintings, mm -hmm. uh, no pictures, of course. Mm -hmm. In the same times, um, I used um, my fantasy, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, nobody can say, no, this is wrong. Did you feel you have a license? Did you feel that you had the freedom then? Yes, I, I have had uh, some freedom. I mean, the same times I, I saw before many, many, uh, many books with, uh, like I said before, with paintings, with uh, 
So uh, at the same time, um, it wasn't difficult to do this movie because no, no, it was difficult. It wasn't difficult, for example, to to work in Macau because in Macau we have had uh, more research. So you can see we said that we saw many, many, many things. So when we were in the, the, the cathedral, so yeah, uh, it was easy. But also, also for Nagasaki, for Nagasaki, yeah. it was more or uh, less complicated to to invent it, the um, the village like Tomoji, mm -hmm. or Goto, um, so it was more anyway. I saw, like I said, many uh, many paintings mm -hmm. and for for for. For me, I just say, and, uh, and then this this was the idea, and then I did my own sketches. I show this to Martin, Martin, he approved, and uh, this is what we did. What would were there any? It sounds odd to say, but the cave is obviously a cave. You know, the shoreline is a shoreline. What were there any? actual or natural locations you were able to use other than just what nature provided? Or was everything constructed that we see? No, no, we find uh, many locations. So, and then we, we build around the location. This was, so we find the first of all, the beautiful location. Then we decide, uh, we decide, Matt, we decide, I uh, decide, oh, this is good for me. Uh, for example, for put to the cross, uh, yeah. or for the old rooms, and when when we when we uh, shot off the rooms and we went to oh, see. Oh, yes, yeah, the uh, the hot springs that are real. Yes. There was a, that's yeah, that's all real. There's no the digital there. So it's not the nice. uh, digital. Yeah. 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 The beginning of the movie. The beginning of the film. That's all. We were there. We had to wear hard hats so and we, stuff. So we did. <laughs> we did uh, <coughs> some job over there, but uh, yeah, in the same. In the same time, we were put all the cross, and then anyway, uh, it was beautiful. The place, yeah, yeah. this was important. Mm -hmm. Now, be because you do both the costume design and the production design mm -hmm. on this film, yeah. I'm wondering, Rodrigo, uh, oh, tell us about your collaboration with Dante and ultimately with Marty in terms of color palette and uh, those those considerations. Mm -hmm. Well, um. I guess just uh, overall, uh, for me, the first thing is that I don't know uh, the fact that I actually ended up shooting this movie after so many years. You know, uh, <laughs> I was born when you started thinking about it. <laughs> so, I mean, and so I don't know if it was luck or divine intervention that I actually was around. <laughs> you know, when when it actually came together. So I'm very grateful to whatever uh, was made that possible. But uh, um, indeed, in terms of uh, everything, the color palette and the the design of it look of the movie, uh, a big part of it certainly was research. And well, like Dante said, it's also imagination, certainly, but, but mostly it was very accurate. And, and Marty was very keen on, on, on you know, really uh, having a lot of uh, uh, people really, you know, experts uh, with us. And uh, for lighting sources, uh, for me that was also really important, and I worked very closely with uh, Francesca as well, with Dante, figuring out what would be an accurate light source and, and how give us, give us a, uh, an example a instance. okay well uh, for example the the candles uh you know we knew that lots of these scenes in the in the huts would have to happen at night because they were hiding the priests are, are you know had to had to hide some lots of scenes uh, had to be at night and uh and windows closed and all that so we needed a, a light source and we found out that what they actually used were little plates with a little wick and oil so that was a lighting source, and, which is a very small, you know, light and projects almost nothing. So, uh, but we ended up uh, for that section using uh, digital cameras to be able to capture actually the candle light. I just augmented with the other little actual modern candles hidden behind the actors or hidden behind rocks and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, that was the kind of thing. Or even towards the end, uh, the, the last scenes. That now it's not a spoiler because we've seen it, but. Uh, the apostasy and all this. Uh, Marty had talked about it, uh, imagining it sort of brown and umber, and uh, and again talking with 
that, how to give it that look. It's night outside, it could be moonlight, but we decided to make it within that color and use fire mm -hmm. almost as hell, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and with Francesco, he found uh, what they, they use, these uh, big uh, torch ears. Yeah. And uh, so we fed them with gas and that was the, the source of light. So anyway, that, that sort of thing was our collaboration. Is there, was that your biggest challenge? I mean, I, I, it's one of these interview type questions. What was your biggest challenge? Oh my God. I'm going to ask it out. Talk about challenges. <laughs> <laughs> this movie got the ball. It was it all. extremely Earthquakes. Earthquakes. Uh, <laughs> mud. From mud. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so, so many, so many. <laughs> but things like, I mean, I think one of, so many. I mean, pornographically, all the night stuff, and that was big, uh, dusk. Sunset, lots of moments like that that I have to figure out how to maintain the continuity of that. Weather, for sure. But there were things like uh, we were looking for around the caves, and we, there was a beach, and we were looking for the, the place for the crucifixion. And, um, you know, the script is on the beach, right? And then Marty sees that area that has a, these waves hitting and they're being rocky and super extremely dangerous, and, and <laughs> that's where the crucifixion is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a challenge. <laughs> that was my challenge. Yes. <laughs> oh, those, 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 that is not a visual effect either. Those crosses were erected in that reef. Yeah. Yeah, that's not digital. That's, uh, I mean, obviously the wave, the close-up of the waves hitting yeah. uh, should get Tsukamoto. And yeah, those waves have to be controlled, and that, those, that medium shot was in a tank in Taichung, mm -hmm. where they shot life from high, right. you know, uh, but uh, nevertheless, the wave, once the wave machine started, you couldn't stop it, mm -hmm. and when you did stop it, there's still a few more waves left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, well, for example, we were in that Jamoji village, and we shot the scene with the samurai come in, and uh, say, okay, we heard there's some Christians here, and there's a, you know, just uh, give you this amount of silver if you tell us who you are, etc., who, who they are. And we shot for a few hours, and it was uh, quite nice, it was uh, sunny. And then um, I, I needed a shot of a, a samurai coming in to the village separate. Um, and as we were uh, setting up the shot, just literally setting up the procession, so to speak, the, the, you know, that place is amazing. The, the, the mist just came in. And we couldn't see anything. And I said, I said, we want to rehearse. And I said, where are they? They're in that mist. I said, start shooting. <laughs> <laughs> just start shooting. And let's see how long it takes those guys to come through. And uh, that's what we did. That's what we did. And then we had to reshoot everything in the morning. <laughs> to match the mist with, with, uh, to match, uh, with that mist. Yeah. You know? And it was wild. It sounds like one of those John Ford accidents. <laughs> yeah, well, you're just standing there, but I said, well, let's rehearse this. Why we're here? Just run the camera. I said, at this point, <laughs> and move it in. You know, we know we're going to pan from one to the other. You know, then we see a Chizo. Do it. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, it was that kind of shooting. It, was, it reminded me sometimes of uh, the shootings that we do were younger in terms of uh, taking advantage of the situation. Uh, our basic crew was uh, slimmed down. You know, uh, we can move uh, pretty quickly. Uh, it was, it was quite, quite amazing. Yeah. So, 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 in spite of years of thought and careful planning, serendipity still plays a role. Well, yeah, I mean, very often I would design, I usually design the shots in my, on the page in the script, and um, I designed a lot of it. Um, some of which I would design only to the point where I'd say, okay, this is a medium shot, and a uh, medium shot from the knees up, and depends on the location as to what the background is. So we get the location, that sort of thing. And I, but I knew that the size should be that way. And when you get there, because you're shooting two, three, five, where well, you may have to be a little closer, that sort of thing. I had camera moves, very few camera moves. Uh, editing, very important, because of the claustrophobic feeling in the cells, closer to the side of the space, back of the space, that sort of thing. But, um, and rhythm of cutting. So uh, these things were designed. However, uh, I had much more design, but when we got to the tops of the mountains, and we'd look out, and I'd say, well, this is it. I mean, you just put the camera there, not just put it, but <laughs> from this position, we can get this and this, and uh, we don't need to do more than what I had, uh, more, you know, uh, coverage of this. Let's simply, the landscape speaks. 
not only to us, but to the, to the characters. Sure. Alan, at what, you and Marty have worked together so long. At, at what point do, does your input begin in this process, once the production is a go, it's happening? Um, after he looks at dailies with me, which is a very important time because he's constantly talking to me as he's watching, uh, telling me how he feels about everything. And I take careful notes of that in my own, and then I start putting the uh, uh, scenes together. Uh, and then he, as soon as he's through shooting, he comes in and starts working with me very intensely right through to the end. Marty's a great editor, and it's his favorite part of filmmaking. <laughs> well, we have that. We had that time together alone and uh, about too many people pounding on the door to get the film finished. <laughs> well, I mean, but is that happening while, during production as well? I mean, you're saying you're watching daily, so that's... Yes, if he's able to, right. Oh, Sometimes okay. we have to wait until after. Yeah. It depends on the movie. It was so, so arduous, this movie. Just getting up to those mountains was incredible. And then when people would come back at the end of the day and come and see me in the editing room, my editing room would floor be covered with mud. <laughs> from their boots, because <laughs> it was very arduous. Yeah, I, I found that it was a little, this one was hard to watch the dailies, and it took a little longer for me to catch up with dailies after the production was finished in New York. We, we looked at them and just plowed away, and uh, uh, that, took, that took a little extra time. How much time? Mm. Well, there were other things involved, family issues and uh, health issues and stuff like that, family. And so that delayed, uh, uh, for a couple of months, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it just, uh, everything went on, it, uh, it became too uh, yeah, well, like difficult to, to, yeah, like, difficult like, like to work straight. straight. Yeah, like it really, really, it really does, yeah. But that's, uh, we sensed it, but it happens. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Tell us about life in your editing. Mm -hmm. What, what, I mean, we, we've all, followed your careers, your, your parallel careers, so, so many years now. What kind of conversations are you having? What, con what, what is the nature of the conversation you're having together? Well, it's everything from uh, politics to uh, <laughs> biblical history to uh, Marty's passion for uh, the clash of Christianity and Rome. Um, we talk about everything. Uh, and it's a fantastic, uh, rich environment. Of course, we talk about the movie a lot. Yeah, sometimes too. <laughs> sometimes we talk about the I'm going to get in trouble because Bridget won't cut it. But she does, you know, she listens to National Public Radio, and then I get all that. <laughs> but, uh, this, and, uh, you this know, I'm a fan of that too, but a couple of times I listen, they say bad things about me. I don't want to listen to me. So, I'm trying to have coffee. <laughs> you know, but, um, and you hear certain things. I don't know if she gets mad at me because I get upset with them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this was such an incredibly rich film to work on uh, for so many reasons. Um, the beauty of Taiwan, mm. which does look like Japan, but it was just stunning right away. I kept telling him, he didn't quite believe me because he was so exhausted. I kept <laughs> saying, it's so beautiful, it's so beautiful. Um, and then the wonderful interaction of those fantastic Japanese actors who are just sensational. It was wonderful because we had a, our translator transliterated, I can't read Japanese characters obviously, but she transliterated what they were saying for me so I could tell when I, I could read the English transliteration and know what they were saying so I could know how to cut it. Yeah, Erico Miyagawa. Yeah, she was with us on that the big scout we did in the, the beginning of the casting in 2009, and so it's been stayed with the production, really. She was invaluable, but um, sure. the, the thing that was so great about this movie is Marty had such an incredibly strong vision for it and style for the camera work and the editing. But the things that you were probably feeling but may not have realized how he was doing it is the claustrophobia and the sense both the, but the sense of helplessness of the priests watching what's happened because they have come to japan and then how he portrays that and and then also the claustrophobia of the prison once the retreat is arrested and so if you look at the film again you'll see that he's constantly shooting from inside the jail, always through the bars, or if he's outside, he's, he's shooting Rodriguez through the bars again, which creates an incredible sense of what it's like to be in a prison. One of the most beautiful things I saw 
was when Mokichi dies on the cross and is carried to his burial pyre. I could not believe how beautiful that shot was. And there was no coverage, no close-ups, no two shots, nothing, just that shot. So when I went to Marty and I said, this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, he said, it's because it's about their helplessness. The priests cannot stop it. They cannot interfere. So there were so many beautiful ideas in the movie, and it, it was just a joy to work. Yeah, very, very much the way we have. We see violence around us, and particularly now on giant screen TVs. And what, what's that feeling? A feeling of help, helplessness. And we, yes, we can be activists, we can do certain things, but up to a point, you're not there, you know, trying to save yourself from the bombs in Aleppo. I mean, what do you do? How do you, could it be at least have compassion? Could we at least feel somewhat complicit? Uh, understand that? Um, all of these things. And so the only thing I could do is just let the shot play. It was like all the suffering in the world. He carried, even the, the, the guards were respectful of, him, of his body as they placed it down. And there are so many echoes of depositions of Christ, and, and uh, it was just, it's a masterpiece shot, I think. Were there other, you, you've implied that you did this perhaps more than once in the movie. Were, were there other key scenes where you had enough confidence in the, the, the beauty that you had in front of you and the composition and the staging that you didn't feel the need for conventional coverage? Uh, well, yes, most of them, most, most of the exterior scenes, there's no doubt, and also for, uh, I think, some of the scenes between Inouye and uh, Rodriguez, mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese, um, I don't even know what's still what's called, what was it called, Dante, the prisoner's office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the office where he in, What's that in a way is yes. um, when he the questions with the the beautiful um, Japanese yeah. interior. Oh, oh yes. So in yeah, yes, we will yeah. we will do finally if this will be the in and Taipei, we find a little location location right location, there will be the whole entire in the house yes, yes. Uh, office yeah. house also little prison and, yeah. and also we do we give the interior studio yeah. together and uh, so. Well the point, the point was that uh, when I imagined an inquisitor's office, I sort of imagined Western style in mind, you know, with a, a table or something, a man is over here on the other side of it, and there are guards around that. But this, um, uh, when, we, when, we did, when we did all the research, this was what the office looked like. Yeah. Uh, and it dictated camera position, mm -hmm. and it dictated uh, the bowl of hot water being placed in a certain way, the way the actors uh, stocking feet and to frame. I'm not cutting that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he moves the, the bowl so so uh, close, and then in a way moves it even closer, and then takes a sip, and then those cuts were designed in, uh, in the script, mm -hmm. but uh, to his side, tighter in, to his back. But the um, the environment itself, those places, and in uh, the Asian sensibility, um, the play of light and shadow, uh, the uh, seemingly uh, empty frames, were filled with uh, power. I thought I when I when I saw it, you know. And so that's where we designed. Then I worked in the Rodrigo and I. That's how we worked out the shots. Well, uh, you, you alluded to this briefly before, but why widescreen? Why two, three, five, two, one? <laughs> I'd like to hear both of you. <laughs> you could say first. Well, um, you know, the, there were many, you know, we could have found 185 for sure, because also the, the mountains, the trees, there, you know, were reasons to go that way. Uh, but what I remember, first of all, we talked about um, optics, for example. We talked about anamorphic lenses. <laughs> So that's something we're, we're attracted to for this movie. So that's a lot of, would give us that aspect ratio. But I think more than that, it was, uh, if you see the, the, the sets and the villages, yeah. and the, there's so much that's why, literally, you know, and, and even the, the samurais when they're sitting, that frontal shot you have of them. I mean, it just kind of really worked into the aspect ratio. And, uh, and then, you know, that's the things we knew beforehand, but then of course when we started seeing you know, Dante's designs, it really fit into yeah. that ratio. 
I mean, uh, obviously Japanese cinema, the use of 235 is amazing, and it's always embedded in my head, but you know, the nature of uh, culture, um, there's, to be oversimplify in a way, but you know, in a sense, they see the, the Japanese culture as human beings are part of nature, and they're close to nature. Uh, when they go into a room, they're on the tatami mat. You know, so you see everything from that level. Nature is part of the house. The light and shadow. There's this beautiful book by Tanazaki, great Japanese author called uh, In Praise of Shadows, explaining um, the, the Japanese point of view of aesthetics. Uh, flower arrangement, um, uh, uh, everything from uh, what seems to a Western eye an empty uh, Japanese room. If you sit there at a certain time of day, well, for two or three hours, it becomes a different room constantly because of the light. And so I thought of that, I was like, okay, and then I just had to put the camera on the ground with them. And so in my mind, uh, there is a use of space. You know, more of a use of space in the inner way scenes, there's no doubt, because he had a bigger place. But uh, even the, the, the farmers had to, to sit on the ground. You know, we guys, have, these things we discovered as we went along, there's air on the tatami mats, the, the farmers, the villagers, and I was told by the technical advisors that they're too poor to have tatami mats, they're strong. They're too poor to have rice. They had cucumbers. That's it. Try cucumbers. So I mean, it, it was it, we, it stripped itself down, and it was constant um, uh, because of the nature of the room. Let's say that village, that village hut. There was a constant uh, uh, closeness of the people in that world, um, and so it dictated sometimes, you know, the actual placement of camera. Again, the, to the rhythm and pacing of the editing, Donald, uh, it's, I, I know it's very hard to articulate something that, that is emotional and that, you know, and that comes from uh, you know, your feelings and your, 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 your conflicts and your discussions and your debates. But when you see a scene like an establishing shot, you know, of the, the, from the, of the cave with the two openings, Oh yeah, you know, and the, the waves hitting the shore and all of that. I mean, is there a point where you say, well, this has got to be this, this shot followed by that shot, followed by that shot? Is it obvious to both of you, or or is that is everything a, a question in the debate? Well, Marty well, did have a feeling that he wanted the pace of the film to be slow, uh, slower than the, the pace of films these days, um, because of the nature of the material. And I think he prepares you for that with the wonderful idea of the cicadas you hear after the, the logos at the beginning. And you must wonder why are why is there no image? And then you start listening to the cicadas. Um, I think maybe it, it prepares you to sort of calm down from our insanely rapid modern life and begin to feel the film in a different way. So that thought was always in our minds throughout. The, the film, but um, of course what happens is you start with it much longer because it's so beautiful and then you feel you may have to cut it down a little and then as time goes on you keep cutting it down and cutting it down till, till uh, you feel it, it justifies its time. Okay, I think he wants to know whether we are here as to which shot goes where. Like no, that's behind, no, that's up. I mean, it's all we do it together, but I mean, the, the, there is there is a system I have, um, certain scenes, and other than that, often, um, you know, she'll look at me and say, hey, you know, this shot is no longer, no longer has the power. The second shot doesn't have the power anymore because of the scene before it's returned. And I said, what do you want to do with it? She said, let me try something. They're like, go look at it. You know, hey, that's great. Keep it that way. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. It really is questioning everything ultimately we first put everything in we do exactly what i imagined and then we look at it it's you know it's too it doesn't work and so she gets on there and says okay what how do we do with this scene? how do we deal with this situation and i you know pretty much also has to be as radical as possible with some of it one of the things that happened on this film is that the images were so beautiful that we felt we could strip out a lot of voice over there's no dialogue they had to create all the dialogue in, in the book, right? and though there's there's no dialogue, okay? so they had to create it, and they used a lot of voiceover. Jay 
Hooks and, and Marty. And what we kept finding was that the power of the faces of some of those villagers and the beauty of Taiwan was actually uh, allowing us to strip a lot of voiceover out and just let the images say what the movie was. <coughs> and that was a calculated thing, too. In the scripting, there wasn't a lot of voiceover. But knowing full well that we were lucky, if we were lucky, we were going to have to strip most of it away. You know? And Taiwan does feel like Kyushu, which is the southern island, and outside Nagasaki is there and that sort of thing. And uh, the voiceover is not really voiceover because it's a letter from Rodriguez to Father Damiano. And when he no longer writes the letter, it's prayer. He's a priest. He talks to God or he prays. So it's all these things. So we had that freedom. We had that freedom to play with it. We just break. At one point, he says, "Please forgive me, uh, uh, Father. I beg your forgiveness." Well, exactly for what? I mean, I know what he means. I know it's there. Uh, he's running towards a hut in the rain because he was about to despair. So my praying to nothing. Um, and you know, these things. You say these things to yourself. Uh, you think to yourself. Some people call it prayer. Some don't. But um, we had that freedom. And then. We would try to put in more voiceover and explain certain things, and when we try, when we try to explain more of the exposition, it got more complicated. <laughs> well, it's, but it's very clear. I mean, you created a very clear through line, and, and uh, whatever it took to get there, you got there. <laughs> uh, how long was your first cut? Your first seven? Three twenty-six. So you cut almost an hour. And was that in little bits and pieces, or were there were there any large sections that had to go? Only large, no. We, we got a few little scenes, but it was mainly shaping, mm -hmm. shaping and responding to the beauty of what was there. You know, mm -hmm. that's how we chose what we did. We had people to see the picture, I mean, close friends or the friends of friends that we could trust in terms of it, you know, uh, or at least people that we were told would accept this material, you know. Uh, and um, we'd get responses. And usually, um, inevitably, after the fourth or third or fourth time, they were the same responses. And so we kept working in the same areas, same areas, unless I felt, no, we're gonna go with that. At a certain point, she tells me, listen, you know, this is one of those things we have to go with. They don't like that, but that's it. I said, I agree. <laughs> but I got other things, other things, and oh, there's something there. Let's go back in. You know, um, uh, but even that first screening at 326, it was great. And a couple of people. And afterwards, we all talked, and they said, I don't, there nobody, they couldn't tell us anything to cut. <laughs> they just said, I don't know what to tell you. You better look at it again and make another cut, and then maybe we could look at it, and then maybe we could talk about it. But they liked it, but they didn't know what to say. Maybe that's because you made such a great film. <laughs> uh, that's my way of saying we have to wrap this up. But, uh, but it's not its not a glib remark. You did make a great film. Oh, thank you, man. <laughs>